Your brother wanted it white. I mixed them both together, and this is what came out, and that's what I shot it. That was the Pink Panther, they called it. And guys like him never busted you for having a pink race car, did they? Uh, did they? Oh, I love them. I love them. They, were, they were ready to, you know, take me out. <laughs> we had some great times. Rainy Charlotte, we were in the All-Star League together, almost every race that we were in together. And that was, you know, uh, a bunch of uh, champion drivers from each track. And we raced dirt tracks and asphalt tracks. We were in, Na I'll never forget this. We were in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. 10,000 people there that day. And they introduce you to the crowd. So, Rene Charlene used to pick out of the hat just before me all the time. It was time he picked his number out of the hat from Bob O'Rourke, and now it's my turn. I go up there, I pick, I put my hand in to get my number, and Rena Charlene comes up behind me and grabs my hair and pulls it off of my head. I had a, a hairpiece on in front of 10,000 people. I wanted 10, to kill one. 10,000 one. Yeah, that's because all oh, your, you brought one of your girlfriends with you. <laughs> and you guys were still friends after that? Oh, yeah, we were good friends. Why, why, why fight? Then he pulled a lot of tricks on me. But at least Stafford, he, but he never cheated on the racetrack, did he? Uh, I don't know if he never cheated, because uh, he, he was a fast driver, and I was a fast driver. But he yeah, always but had that a uh, little more to me on the asphalt, and I think he was cheating. I'm pretty sure he was cheating. No, 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 I, I, I wouldn't cheat. I, you, think, you think I do that to my friends? But I wasn't your friend at the time. Oh, okay. Well, then maybe you know, all the $15 and the $5 and the $10 that, that you used to have in your hand, the number that you were going to pick out of the hat. Oh, let's, let's double up the bet tonight, you know, because whoever gets the poll, you know, you get double. Oh, yeah, okay, we're at his brother-in-law's track up in Albany at Saratoga Speedway. He pulls out of the hat the pole. Yeah. The next night we're at another place, he pulls the pole again. I had to pay him double two nights in a row. But all the while he had it in his hand before he put his hand in there. No, no, no. Ah, that's that what you say. No, I know I you would never do that to me. You would never do nothing like no, that. No, no, no. What about at Stafford what you did me? Uh, you know the I'm over there pulling, I put my hand in the thing, what do I come out? A rat trap. <laughs> you know, he put the rat trap in there when, when he got his number out. He says, ah, Greco's next. Well, I'll get him. This is my track. I'm representing, you know, Stafford and the Speedway and uh, the All-Star League. And really put the tra mouse trap. I, that's another all, pull, all uh, my you fans. Pull the, you pull the trap out, didn't you? Hanging on your finger. Uh, my finger was there, uh, and the, the trap was hanging on my finger. <laughs> I thought that was pretty nice. The people liked it. Yeah, I know that. I didn't. There was, uh, there was a bunch of us who grew up around Riverside Park, literally and figuratively, you know, at least in the sport of auto racing. We all came in with a great deal of, of enthusiasm, and I'm, I'm glad to say some of us are still here, including our next presenter. Uh, about the third year that I announced at the park, I was, I was just out of college, and the Springfield newspapers had an opening for their auto racing columnist. Uh, the auto racing columnist of the Springfield paper was a position created uh, by Ed Carroll, who owned Riverside Park, uh, to placate it so that there would be news of the racetrack in the paper that would help support the generous advertising budget uh, that Riverside Park had with the newspaper. So uh, I applied for the job, went up and met Carol Robbins, the executive editor, and gave him my credentials and sampled my writing, and he said, we'll call you. And about three weeks later, I got a letter uh, that said, uh, thank you very much for your interest, but we have uh, decided to hire a young gentleman by the name of Dean Nardi, uh, because of his special interest in journalism. And I gotta tell you, at the time, the words kind of stung, uh, but 
every time I pick up an issue of Trackside, uh, I find that uh, he was right. Uh, here is the editor of Trackside magazine, Dean Nardi, for our next presentation. tremendous amount of talented people that have been presented here today and all very deserving. Um, just glad that the near board decided to save the best for last. That's how I feel about it anyway. It's just like having dessert after dinner. It's, it's just the best part. And that was, that's what it was like watching Billy Greco drive a race car. Uh, I came to realize that Billy Greco was something special back in the days. Now I talk about back in the days at Riverside Park. People up here have spoken about how tough a place Stafford was, and Lowood, and on and on and on. But let me tell you, Riverside Park was about as tough as they come. There was four heats, there was two semis, there was a, a concy, there was a B concy, and maybe you got into the main and you started from the rear of the handicapped field, and it was it was tough racing. And the park was just a special place to be on Saturday nights for somebody growing up in the sport. Uh, it was a tough place. Drivers had their own sections in the grandstand. Uh, you had to keep them separated, and it was for a good reason, because it kind of cut down on the arrests and the hospitalizations. <laughs> uh, but Billy Greco, when he pulled that 43 out onto the track, whether it was for practice or for heat race or whatever, I mean, we knew what just where the people stood, and half of them would stand up, and they'd be yelling and screaming and cheering, just like the troops would come home from the war. The other half, well, they were probably yelling some insults and throwing stuff, and it was just plain pandemonium. Uh, but I thought it was great. I mean, I'd, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. Uh, probably never seen anything like that since. For, for years, on a Saturday night, I never even had a date. Uh, we just couldn't miss Riverside Park. Bill Greco was the king of the, of the Connecticut gang there, most of whom had names ending in vowels. Uh, it was Cambino, Godiosi, Galulu, Centenaro, Carangelo, Toro, on and on and on. But when I got to be 16 years old and got to go down and visit a little bit with the drivers, I met Bill Greco. And in the years that followed, Billy took me places that I had, had dreamed about and read about in the pages of Illustrated Speedway News back when that was the only racing paper around. And I saw him drive for the Greedy Brothers and their famous cars at Stafford and Thompson. I traveled the All-Star League circuit with Billy and went to many tracks throughout the Northeast for years. I went to Trenton and Langmore and some of the tracks in Jersey like Old Bridge and Rich Bedoin's 500. But most importantly, I guess, and uh, the thing I know Billy best of all for, and I'm sure many of you do, is the Red Metal Flake Coupe number 43 he drove for his brother George. Well, it was a Red Metal Flake Coupe most of the time. Uh, one year, the car was, was better known as the Pink Panther. Uh, which there's a story behind that. And uh, I guess George had decided that the car didn't show up that good on the racetrack. So he, uh, he told the guy who was going to paint the car, well, we want to make it white this year. Well, that was all right. They got some white paint. Billy went into the garage uh, the next night and heard that it was going to be white. He said, eh, that's, that's not going to work. This car has always been red metal flake, and that's what it's going to be. Go get some red metal flake paint. So the guy who was going to paint the car didn't know what to do. He had the white paint in one hand, he had the red paint on the other. So that night he mixed the two of them together, sprayed the car, voila, pink. <laughs> and there was the Pink Panther. I'm not shy about saying that Bill Greco was my hero as a driver, but he became more than that as I, as I knew him longer and longer. It was obvious to anybody that he had exceptional talent as a racer, but he was also a genuine person, one who was always willing to help out a friend or family member in times of need. Uh, Billy drove truck for a living for many years. He might get home at 4 in the morning from driving truck and get a call from somebody in distress. Uh, like the time one guy had a trailer come apart on the George Washington Bridge. Uh, that would be Molly Ophelia and myself. <laughs> Called Billy Greco and he was right there to help. 
there's no way to get here today, and I figured it was because somebody called and broke down on 91 someplace, and Billy went to get him. I mean, the numbers detailing Billy's accomplishments are, are tremendous. There's the park championships, the fact that he won a race at every track hosting modifieds in the state of Connecticut, on and on and on. They're all written down in the program. But what I'd like to add to that is Billy Greco, as I know him, was and is a personable, unassuming, and wonderful guy. Some people later on in his career used to call him Gramps. I called him Dad because, in reality, in my youth, Billy Greco was like a second father to me. I was speaking with Ralph Solon the other day, another, another fellow that Billy has, has driven for, and I think he put it best. He said, Billy, Billy Greco never had a big head. He just left a big footprint on New England racing. In my mind, there was no one better in his prime than Billy Greco, and that's why we're honoring him here today. So, Bill, you're the best. Come on up there.
Thank you for your